Here. 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 We're going to review the Charter Review Committee on preliminary recommended changes. Derek, you want to kind of get us teed up here and yeah, thank you. moving in the right direction? Just to sort of make it easier for everyone because there's a, a number of changes that probably don't require any discussion and, and, and really to give everyone some time to absorb it. I'll run through the entire list of changes that were voted on by the Charter Review Committee uh, and then at the end if either the review members who uh, recommended the changes themselves or the council has any questions, you'll have an opportunity to do that. Okay. Um, beginning with the very first change, uh, this is to Section 7 of the Charter, starting at page 15 of your packet, and, I, and I'll just describe it very briefly. This is a, was a section that was transitional in nature, talking about the uh, creation of the district, the areas annexed into it. It's, it's totally a transitional element. It has no real bear, continued bearing in the Charter, and so it was recommended for deletion. And there'll be a number of those coming forward. Uh, the second change was to section 18, uh, and that is on page 17 of your packet. Uh, the section 18 deals with the powers of the mayor. The last sentence has been modified to remove provisions regarding a vacancy, uh, and you will see that along with some sections and uh, changes in section 21 coming up, I'm addressing vacancies in the uh, city Council a little bit different, cleaning up the language, making it a little more clear, but this is a non-substantive change at this moment, but this is some language that, that in context, it'll make sense. And Derek, hang on just for a second. I think sure. Greg had a question. I, just, I apologize. I was trying to get some from my cup. Um, are we asking questions on the as we're going gonna, through here, or? I think that just for ease, I'll run through everything. Okay. Because there's really probably only four or five major substantive changes, and then it'll be easier to, to have a conversation about those. A few times gotcha. to, to absorb it. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Next section on page 18 is section 19, and this is the compensation provisions for the city council. Uh, there's been a couple of changes here. The first change is uh, you're not getting a raise. It's just a uh, reflection of the current rates um, versus what they were 10 years ago. Uh, there's also been a change in the COLA formula. The uh, COLA is now specifically tied to an index by the Department of Labor and the, re the requirement that the cost of living adjustment be uh, linked to raises to the, seat, to the staff has been decoupled. So now there could be a COLA adjustment regardless of whether the city staff has got an increase. Additionally, the, you'll see a lot of uh, underline at the bottom of that section. Uh, there has been a committee that will be created uh, proposed to be created to provide recommendations on uh, council salary increases in the future. It's not mandatory. Uh, it's mandatory that the committee is created, but the, their recommendations are not mandatory, but they do provide some basis for someone to look at the issue and provide recommendations to the city council. If those recommendations or your own recommendations uh, to make increases are adopted, they will go into effect at the next subsequent election. So that's been, that's been added as well. The next change, starting also on page 18 and, and tied to that, that uh, section 18 change we made earlier, uh, is at the bottom of section 21, so you'll see at the, at the beginning of page 19. Um, the short answer is for this is if there is a vacancy on the city council, whether it's the mayor or any other uh, district member, if that vacancy occurs within six months of a previously scheduled general election, then the vacancy will just stand open until that general election. There will be no need for a special, special election to fill that seat. The duties of the mayor, should the mayor be vacant, will be transferred to the deputy mayor. As you all recall, deputy mayor is selected by the, the council members. So those provisions would be in place. There would be some continuity of leadership. There wouldn't be the need to scramble to set up a special election. You would just wait that those six months. And that's not really a very substantive change from what the current practice is. The major change is that the deputy mayor uh, will roll into that role instead of wait, calling for an immediate special election. The next change is on 
page 19, about three quarters of the way down, it's the section 24. This change, currently we have a provision in the charter that says that uh, special meetings cannot be called with, with any less than 12 hours notice. Now the Florida Attorney General has recommended no less than 24, so we were already being fairly aggressive with that in the charter. Uh, the recommendation from the committee at this point is to give no less than 48 hours notice before any uh, meetings could be called and that is exclusive of weekends. So therefore, you could not call for a, a, on a Friday late afternoon for a Monday meeting. It would have to be 48 full hours uh, before that meeting could be called. There is an exception for emergencies. And so you'll see that that language about a special meeting for emergencies to deal with only issues resu resulting from those emergencies could still be called in less than 12 hours notice. The next change is on page 20. And this is to your fairly voluminous provisions regarding ordinance adoptions in the charter. Um, this was a recommendation made by myself to the committee. Uh, and my concern is that we have adopted a, a number of extraneous policies with respect to the adoption of ordinances. Some of you all will recall that once an ordinance is adopted, we have to wait 30 days before it's published, there, uh, uh, before it goes into effect. We also have post-adoption publishing rules that go into effect. Florida law already sets out the process by which you notice and adopt uh, ordinances. I, my concern is that any additional time or any additional hoops that you have to jump through is one more thing you may miss, and particularly some of the ordinances you may be adopting to address an urgent situation will not be able to go into effect in time. And so that, that was the thought pattern behind that. Um, the next section, that we made change recommendation changes to was section 21 I'm sorry section 32 beginning on page 21 um, similar to the last change this is a I'll call this a chap a section that was adopted uh, when the city was created but no longer due to technical reasons is really required in the past um, almost all jurisdictions codified their ordinances in big binder books that you would review this section lays out the process for codifying our ordinances, regulations, and it sets out, it has to be done on every so many years. We currently both have all of our ordinances available online, the city's website, and we, we publish them far more quickly on municode.com or other services. So really wasn't a need to have this. It was just another step that the city really doesn't need to follow. Um, we do have binders, and they are updated more frequently than this charter provision currently provides. So this is a uh, I will call it a non-substantive change. It's just technology has moved, moved faster than, than the original charter contemplated. Um, the next change is to section 44, and that is uh, beginning on page 25. Um, this requires, and this is one of the last things we adopted uh, from the recommendations, uh, city council action on the budget it required that we publish the entire budget in the newspaper. Um, we already publish the adoption of the um, budget on online. That's because there has been a change. Florida statutes requires it, wants it to be online, available. For, it's one of the few things we are absolutely required to always have online. Um, and we already send, of course, mailed notices of ad valorem taxes to everyone with the dates of our budget hearings and the ad valorem uh, dates. So this was just an extraneous um, policy that was asked by finance if we could remove um, not really anything additional to add on that. The next change is to section uh, 47 on page 26. This is lapse of appropriations. And what basically this provision provided for is that um, if there is an expenditure uh, that's listed on the budget that hasn't been expended in three years, it, it rolls off the budget. Um, it, that excludes CIP uh, items. Uh, quite frankly, the CIP is already required now by, by Florida law to be adopted each year. We also adopt our budget each year, and so really these, these budget items are reappropriated every year regardless. So the, the, the concept of the lapse is not really anarchical. We, we couldn't really find a reason why it was adopted. It is contained in a number of charters. In fact, I, contact the city of Cape Coral who recently just added it to their charter 
and I couldn't get an answer out of them why they did. <laughs> um, I think I think the real issue is good budget keeping and, and record keeping will show that if you're not spending the money, if you've allocated money, you're not spending it. You'll address that internally. And we're not sure that really needed to be a charter provision. Um, the next section that we changed was to chapter. I'm sorry, section 50 on page 27. Um, it's a similar change. Uh, this, uh, as I stated earlier, now chapter 163 requires that we adopt our CIP and that the items in that CIP be items that are funded in the next five years. We have to adopt it every year. We adopted last year in December. Um, so this provision sort of is a little bit in con conflicted with it, but we're just trying to take out unnecessary complications uh, between what we already do and what's required by state law. And, and as with some of the other changes, every time we add a few more hoops, we run the possibility of making the process more complex than it needs to be. Um, the next change is to section 56. This is one you may want to have some conversation with about at the end of my run through. Um, there are effectively changes. This section came in two parts and were voted in at different times during the committee's work. Uh, the first section has to do with um, land use decisions and in addition to the ex parte disclosures that are already required when there's been communications on a land use item adding to that a disclosure of any campaign contributions um, by any of the interested parties. And the way we, we phrased that was who have communicated interest. That means you, know, you, wouldn't, you don't have to be clairvoyant to know that this property has a, a neighbor who hasn't voiced a, a concern. But if they voiced a concern to you or to the council and you know that that person has contributed to your campaign in the past, you would have a duty to disclose that. Um, the second second part of the uh, proposed changes uh, may or may not be mutually exclusive of the first, depending on how it ultimately comes out. But this provision would be to end all ex parte communications on any land use related matter. So the applicant would not be able to make their case outside of the public hearing so that everyone would have the benefit of, of having those communications. However, there would also be no ex parte communications between the council and staff or neighbors or any other interested parties. That was, I think the thought would be to focus all the, the communications and the entire record on that that occurs at the meeting. Uh, section 62 is the next change. Uh, that is on page 34. This is a provision and in part eth echoing uh, chapter 112 of state ethics law, uh, which pro uh, provides and prohibits potential abuse by elected officials who may be attempt to coerce staff into partic supporting particular candidates or measures. Uh, the committee further recommended uh, prohibiting the public officers being high level city officials, myself, Arlene, some of the senior staff from uh, being engaged, supporting, or uh, contributing to particular candidates. Uh, running for city or office, as well as prohibiting them from running for office themselves. The next change is to section 68 on page 35. Uh, this was another transitional element talking about uh, early resumption of duties prior to 2000 when the city came into uh, effect. Um, that's transitional element recommending removal. Uh, the next Section is 7072. That is also a transitional element. It has to do with, I'm sorry, it's section 70. Apologize. Um, transitional ordinances and resolutions. Um, again, this is another residual item from when the city was incorporated, recommending removal. Uh, section 71 and 72 deal with transitional comprehensive plan and land development regulations coming over from Lee County. All of those have been supplanted by this point. So other than historical reasons, there's no value of keeping this in the charter and recommending removal. The next item is section 73. This has to do with state revenue share sharing. And originally, this was slated for removal along with the remainder of the transitional elements. I did request that we clean up the language to show that um, the Florida legislature in creating the city of Benita provided that we would be entitled to 
using the fire district and the other special districts for the calculation of shared revenue. So the way this works is that state revenue sharing um, operates as there's a statutory calculation. If there is enough of a millage calculated by a city uh, based on whatever their, their prevailing millage rate is, they are then entitled to, I don't want to call it, but free money from the state. The state has formulated a dividend out to all the cities that meet that criteria. Limited governments um, like ourselves, Village Vistero, Fort Myers Beach, on their own generally do not meet those requirements. But the legislature in creating those cities has said, well, because you are not a full service district, you don't have a fire district, for instance, or maybe you don't have a library like in Fort Myers Beach. We will add those millages to yours in order to get you across that line because if, if but for those independent special districts you would have to provide those services you would hit those millage rates um, we removed it at Fort Myers Beach when I was the town attorney there there was some question about whether that would negatively impact them that language so it, it did not but to protect you from other questions about that I just left the language in place um, and then the final transitional element is section 76, and it is elimination of transitional elements from the charter. It basically said that you could, by adoption of ordinance, remove all those elements. Now, what that means is if, if your recommendations are all, uh, the recommendations of the committee are accepted, we will adopt an ordinance that removes the vast majority of these changes. The remainder would go to referendum. And that is the end of my report on the recommendations. Okay. Council, what's your pleasure? Do you want to go back and uh, obviously there's some items I would imagine through there. We've, um, we can start with our discussion item on section 15. Why don't we do that, but feel free to take this conversation anywhere you want it to go on any of the various sections. Um, section 15 uh, deals with the uh, total cap versus contribution limits. Yeah, and, and Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind, I, what I, there were a couple of items that the committee did not get to a final vote on. They felt that there were issues of concern, but that they wanted to bring them to the council to see if the council wished either to provide direction for them to look at or wish them to, to look into deeper. Uh, they, they were discussed repeatedly but could not come to a consensus, and so I think I believe the thought was that bringing them to the council may get some direction to see if there's even support for those type of amendments by the council, and then they would, with your direction, go back and look at them further support to look into these are on the last item on the agenda this is section 15 19 24 and 46 there are no proposed languages for any of those um, I, I can tell you that section 15 and you'll all see a handout in front of you um, section 15 of the current Benita Charter has a fairly complicated um, all of you obviously are very familiar with it having gone through elections yourselves uh, complicated uh, scheme for figuring out what the total dollar amount of contribution limits are for campaigns. Um, the committee looked at that issue. They looked, asked me to look at other areas, and so what I provided them was a list of what our, all the neighbors provide. Um, and effectively, all the neighbors, with a few exceptions, match the Florida state's already uh, contribution limits of $1,000 uh, per candidate. Now, that does not exclude, that excludes PACs, and it excludes uh, campaign contributions made by the candidate themselves, but the individual or business contributions are limited to $1,000. Some of the um, limits you'll see on this form that are from Sarasota County that show limits below that. Um, I looked at the history of those. For instance, the city of Venice is at $500. Well, up until just a few years ago, the statutory limit was not 1000 it was 500 so they had tied theirs to the, to the limit when it was 500. When it went up, it stayed in the charter because they didn't go to referendum. Um, Sarasota County, City of Sarasota, uh, and Northport all have fairly kept theirs low. That are not Can I just ask uh, Peter a quick procedural question here? Mm. First of all, thanks to everybody for all the hard work you've put in. Um, I know all of council would feel that way. Um, I've got a, a question of exactly what we're doing here today. Uh, because I believe there's supposed to be a public hearing on the back of what the advisory committee comes up with. 
and then it comes to city council for city council to make a decision and city council I believe can accept reject change do whatever they want uh, with any of the suggestions by the advisory committee kind of like the zoning board you don't have to accept it whatever so I'm kind of assuming what we're doing today is not getting ahead of the public hearing and making a decision on what the advisory board has done as much as having a report from you as to what they where they are and maybe giving direction look into this more or less or am I wrong correct the the uh, group couldn't come to an agreement on just these issues right and we wanted direction from you whether uh, they were important to do right whether they were things that you thought were not not important to look and into. how to go ahead to look into correct okay not this is what we believe no uh, in regard to uh, one let's take uh, that you've heard already the ethics uh, John is going to talk about that right. the pros and cons and you know what we had right otherwise uh, these are the but we're not making decisions on any of that. No. Today, or You're just telling us, go ahead or don't go ahead. Well. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, that could be looked into. Yeah. So that's. Well, that's don't go ahead wouldn't be a decision. And I'm just concerned that the advisory committee, you know, have its independent view, not our view to them. I can so assure you this group has its own independent <laughs> view. Which would then go to a public hearing before we say do this do that right okay correct thanks right Derek do you have any no I was just gonna say the 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 recommendations they've already gone through will go before the, the public hearings and then come back to you again mm -hmm. it was just, the idea was I think these outstanding items and actually section 19 we have language for it I think they just wanted to, to flush it out further if there was more time to address those to kind of have time before they go to public hearing that time is running out so I think that the idea was the committee might see if there was any input the City Council had on that before it went to those public hearings and when this comes to a vote do we they vote on it in total or section by section they have been voting section by section and when the people vote do they do it section by section yes. the people will vote section by section okay. like um, I have a question about something that's not on that's not been suggested here uh, in regard and I don't know if it's appropriate to do it you know but under section 24 um, where they talk about meetings and I'm not sure whether this creates a problem for uh, or the council should we want to have what we call workshops you know where maybe one or two or three of us meet together is this for hit I don't understand how the, that meeting language would work because we did that in the past and there was some um, I guess not confusion but we weren't it wasn't quite clear whether that was okay so <laughs> there had been a discussion where you set up almost like a subcommittee of the council Correct. Correct. where you would meet in the it would be an opportunity the public could attend the meeting Correct. minutes were taken but then the minutes would be approved in the regular city council meeting and there was so different so we could still we could still do that that's that this, is, this doesn't create a problem for that that's all my only question well the it's it's because your prior because your charter said 12 hours the issue probably never came to a question um, there's nothing in section 24 that says distinguishes between meetings at which actions are taken at and workshops you would want to advertise any meeting more than two of you getting together mm -hmm. to meet those requirements though they could not take action as a city council um, I would say that we would probably at some one address with the committee later on making a carve out for workshops or I, our meetings where there's no action taken right. where they can just be just like information gathering correct or well, the other the other so now that we're talking about the other sort of possibility is there are occasions where um, more than one city council member may come and speak at 
the MPO, or, well, not the MPO is not a good example, but no. the, at the Lee County Commission meeting, and to avoid someone making a charge of sunshine violations, um, you, we may advertise it as a meeting of the city council for those meetings. And if it happened very quickly, even though there'd be no action by the city council, uh, this may prohibit that. So we'll, we'll look at that and, and uh, then we'll Well, we've, we've done that in a lot of cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good for now, Amy? Yeah, I'm trying to go. Yeah, no, no, that's great. In Je order of what you Sure, mean. no, absolutely. Jesse? Uh, just to piggyback on what Amy was saying, as, as the person who came up with this specific amendment, just to kind of get everybody in the room on the same page, how this came to life, um, this had to do with a land use issue that the city had last year where on a Friday they decided that we we're going to have a Monday vote. And I'm talking about the cannabis dispensary issue. Um, so. As far as workshops, I'm not worried about that. I just want to make sure that there's 48 business hours for any time that you all are going to go up there and make a decision that's going to drastically alter anything going on at Bonita. So to give those folks 48 business hours to show up. So point being, no Friday at 4 o'clock for a Monday at 8 a.m. meeting. That's, that's the spirit of what I'm trying to do. So workshops, carve that out however you want. I'm just saying logistical votes. I want the people who need to have enough response time. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. With the number of requirements to call a meeting, again, getting back to my question, the fact that we have like four, what if two of us want to work on some special thing? Do, That's do not have, a special session at Congress. Do we have to, do we have to have? I think it's not. We'll, we'll address that back at the yeah. committee. I don't want to get the crafting language right here, but basically we'll, we'll I'll bring back a proposal for the committee to look at for recommendations that says something for workshops or no action meetings where no action is taken something and, like that is probably fine and previously you have had the ability to do that within your regular city council meeting you've suggested that two or more of you might be meeting on a specific topic and then the staff we've advertised that made sure the public had access but no decision making was happening at those okay thank you I have one that in my view uh, I'd appreciate more thought on by the committee. That's on page 17. And Could you tell me the section because I have it blown up so I can see it. It's uh, section page 17. It's section 15. It's 15. Section, uh, yeah, referendum okay. campaign spending limits. Yeah. And I don't have an answer. I just have something to think about, which is so we have limits on expenditure, but uh, PACs are mentioned here, but PACs that form outside of this are, as I understand, in addition to this. So, for example, uh, let's say my district, $12,000 or something like that is my limit. Um, if some PAC goes out and gets formed and wants to spend $100,000 uh, without coordination with me, for me, or against me, that's not covered by this. Is that, is that correct? That's correct? All right. So we basically, you know, the guys who wrote this 16, 18 years ago had obviously some idea of we want, Jackie, when you ran, we want modest local right. government spending. Now the reality is we have PACs. So I'd appreciate if the committee. I can assure you we didn't even think of PACs then. All right. Right. So I, I would just appreciate if the committee went back and reflected on that, what the effect of that is, because we basically have an open back door. We have a limit, but we have an open back door for unlimited spending. And to me, that's something ought to be focused on. But can, Derek, this is mm. towards you, can, they, can the charter limit that? Because the fact they have to figure out. But legally, I don't think they can. That's what I'm asking, right. Derek, mm -hmm. because if you have no, if you have no recollection of it, Right. You're not supposed to know about it. That's what a PC is for, you not knowing about it. Right. How is the charter going to know about it? Right. How are they going to know that you've already spent it? So is it legal to limit a PC? It, and we, we've talked quite a bit about this at the charter review le level. And so we were looking at the campaign contributions, not, not the rep, this particular section, but the probably combined. And a lot of the discussion had to go around the idea of you can't limit you can't limit that money that's not under the control of the candidate uh, at the same time I think there was some conversation saying well give, given that and the amount of misinformation that is out there should the campaign limits be increased to allow the candidates to be able to to right so that's that? what 
and bring and there's, it there's, over. There's other things you can do that affect it, but, uh, but no, you can't regulate something. And you can see this language very clearly says, no candidate shall you know, mm -hmm. take contributions in excess, but doesn't right. provide tax money. So I'm not trying to be presumptuous about a conclusion. I just want them to look at it. No. The answer might be, we've got a dysfunctional system. We have to get rid of it. You know, but I'm, I don't think that's our place today to tell them. They, I think they have to go back to No, the I just didn't want to waste their time if it's illegal. Well, he'll tell them. He'll tell them. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll look into that. Just to look into it. Okay. Jesse? Number one, you, you can't regulate PACs. So how would you recommend that you do that? See, this is the no, 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 no. This because is the conversation I don't want to get into today. Right, well, here's the question. If, if we're not going to meet again, right. we're going to meet, right. and you expect us to do that, I give us an idea of I how you would regulate PACs. I, I didn't say that. He didn't say that. What did I you didn't say we that. We are going to look into the fact right. of PACs, and can they be regulated or not? Or we should we are going to do that. Right. He's not going right there. Right, because he knows the answer is no. He does. Well, the other, Jesse. The other answer might be get rid of the limit. Possibly. Uh, and that's, that's, that's one way to do it. In other words, yeah. I mean, part of the problem with this situation, think about it. This is an antiquated way to decide how we're going to vote. This, we're one of the only cities who does it this way. Does what? It, does it based on population. And, and, and then says you can spend this much and this much. Look at the list. I mean, we're one of the few who actually do it. I mean, most of these municipalities are saying go to Florida statute. Why are we recreating We're the wheel? We're not on this We're, list. What, it, how do, what, what, do you, what do we follow? We don't follow statutes. Yeah, this list Ours is a handout. We're not on it. Because we have a special... special <laughs> right. Uh, exactly. only have that's, one that's my point. I only have one suggestion. Please go look at it, not discuss it today. Correct. Because we're not here to tell you. You're the advisory committee. You're Correct. supposed to come and, and we will look at let it. Let us know what you think. Exactly. Honestly, <laughs> you know, what honestly let us know what you think. <laughs> Which is great. Um, and Pete, that was item 15. Yeah, so yes, we've talked 15. about 15. Do you guys want to move on to 19, or do you want? Sure. what do you think? I've, I, you'll see that uh, I've given you language for 19 that has been yeah, voted on. That's great. Um, I think that's really just if you had any comments on it, because this, is, this was something that they wanted to discuss, that the committee wanted to discuss with you, but they also did vote on language. Which one? Uh, 19. 19. Section 19. It's on right. page 18. 18. 18. What do you want me to say? So, <laughs> I, so the committee discussed the opportunity of having a, 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 another reappointed committee and wanted to kind of feel some thoughts on that from the city council. Section 19. If I may. Well, the question is, well, I mean, is that we can decide that. I just had one concern. I mean, to me, the top section of it is contradictory to the bottom section. Top section says this amount of compensation shall be revised annually based on the cost of living of COLA. Then the bottom it says every three to five or every uh, no less than every four years you'll get a committee to look at it. I just want a clarification of my own. The top part is an automatic cola. The bottom mm -hmm. part is like a salary adjustment. Right. Are we paying the right amount of money for our population? <coughs> yeah. All right. So I wanted was a clarification yeah. on that. Okay. Well, then my second just in my the advisory. Thing. My second question would be to the to the, the lawyer uh, to the, the lawyer, lawyer and to the assistant city man or to the city manager. Been here four years. I ain't getting no cold. <laughs> well, that's all right. So it's already in there. But we no, should be getting no, it's only if the yeah. staff gets because it was tied to the same time and manner as city employees. Yeah, city employees are no longer on cola. I know that. So that's why we that's haven't got cola. That's why it's Same. Just cola. You're okay. just saying. We should say thank you to the. Tying tying it to the index just makes the most sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just tied to an index, and then there's it's not a part. It's there's. The yeah. only suggestion I would make is that you pick a month and a date. Oh. Good. Because they do that monthly from year to year. I know in my previous uh, life or my union life, we picked a date. That way it could be budgeted on that. We knew the CPI for April of the previous year. That way you know it's 2.2 .2 for that region. And now they can budget for it instead of waiting until, oh, let's pick September. And, oh, we're a month away. We don't know what it is. We don't have anything budgeted. What, what is the best date? Ballpark, or we think we'll pick the date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, what, see what Social Security does. They can do it annually. Yeah, just a, a date. Just yeah, that way they we know. Got it. We got it. We'll provide staff update on how we do our process as well for the board to discuss. Okay. Okay. Uh, do we want to move on to section 24? Okay. Discussion of city council meetings, meeting schedule, evening meetings. 
Um, I guess we did discuss this, the 48-hour notice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So. But there was also a, a discussion about uh, one of the questions was asked whether or not the city council would should consider moving to all night meetings. I think that was. So we've had that discussion at city council. We made a decision, but. I don't know that we want to cramp the style of this group. I mean, if the group wants to go make a recommendation, I don't have an issue with that. But not here. You can go back in their committee. And Derek, just for the record, that was it wasn't all night meetings. It was a staggered meeting schedule that incorporated the like two of them, yeah. one, two of them, one. It wasn't all two in the day, one at night. Exactly. So just for background, the, the discussion we had was about what well, Peter was going to uh, the night meetings all the time right. and uh, I think one of the concerns I know personally was staff have lives too uh, they have kids at home etc and before we do that shift uh, maybe we should think twice about it and we decided not to but mm -hmm. I don't think that prohibits this advisory committee right. from mm -hmm. thinking about it if they want to right? Right. Yeah. the reason I wanted to do it was really because I had a number of you know parents is it was there something going on you guys good no we're just okay. smiling okay I just the reason I want to do it is because we have a lot of families who don't have the ability to come during the day and the retirees can come during the day and that's great they don't like to come at night but many of them could come at night the parents and, and the folks who are working 40 hours a week, they don't have the ability to come during the day because they're at work. So what I was saying is if we spread it out, we still have the night meeting. We can still get everybody who wants to go at night, fine, but day it would open up for more of the general population of people who are not currently participating to potentially come. Because if it's during the middle of the day, they can't come. It's not an option. That's why this came back up. So yes, I care about the city staff, but I care about the citizens. So. That's why I wanted to think about this. But these citizens also have the same concerns as family. They have family at home, as you said. Right. So they might also want to stay at home after working all day. Right. So just by moving it tonight doesn't mean that people who have nine to five jobs um, are going to come. It doesn't mean that they're going to come, but it means they have the ability to Why don't to we come. talk about because this? Because nine, they nine to five, they don't have the ability to if they're at work, is my point. All right, let's stop. So we'll look forward to what your committee decides on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Next sec section, yeah, 46, go ahead, Derek. Yeah. 46F, and uh, this was an interesting uh, discussion at the committee level. What page, so, Derek? It's 26. on page 26. Thank you. It's the very last uh, subsection of, of section 46. City charter hereby provides for a legal debt limit which caps the amount of outstanding long-term debt liabilities to 10% of the assessed value within the city. We uh, went and looked up what that value is, and it was like $140 million, or some astronomical mm -hmm. amount of money, uh, well beyond what the, the, I think the city would ever really consider borrowing. Mm -hmm. So the- It should be in the billion. I, it, may, it may have been in the billion. <laughs> 1.4 <laughs> billion. Yeah, I'm sorry, 140 billion. Yeah, billion. So the mm -hmm. question really was, should that number be adjusted <laughs> to something that's realistic as a-, as a so as Is a, there a controversy about that? <laughs> no, we just didn't come up with a number on it. Well, I mean, at least in half. I mean, more than that would be. You're probably feeling that was practical. high or low. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I I, I, high. How, how much did uh, not Logan, uh, Imperial cost to yeah. do? If oh, the, uh, property value is $11 billion. Are you talking about the stormwater? The the no, no, when, when, when oh, Imperial oh, Parkway was $140 Parkway. billion. Dollars. Um, but, I mean, lar large projects could yeah. easily. Yeah. Down your road. Or they can be well. Um, well, there's two. There's two. Two steel elements. Is it's worse at the ten percent, the ten five percent. We looked at other communities. It's generic. The other part is tying it to assessed value. Mm -hmm. So you could change the what is calculated versus the the dollar amount. I think the the question that my notes indicate from the the committee was they didn't want to go off into a long research project to try and figure out what would be reasonable without. The council saying this is something that warranted looking. So we can get a well, consensus here. Yeah. What kind of numbers are we really talking? Because right. billion. Well, billion I'm, I'm, it's one billion, is what it is. One billion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If it's if it's a, if it's taxable value, it's one point one three. Yeah. That's what I mean. But if it's assessed, it's higher. It's, 
Assess property value. That's the yeah, but there's, there's billion dollars. There's, there's assessed for taxable. But it's still ridiculous, so, right. in my opinion. <laughs> yes. If it's a billion plus or minus a hundred million, you know, that's we should be talking in hundreds of millions. But we might be able to. And I don't remember this. There are some um, metrics that people use for municipalities to determine their implied rating system, and they mm -hmm. look at. I, I, you know, there's some connection between revenues. I think. Anyway, look at it. Ask Ann about the finances because I'm, I'm really shaky yeah. on this. But you could look at that, or we could just pick a number, you know? I, I, will, I will look at bond rating. Committee will come back and Yes, I mean, it, has to, it needs a little more research. And I, bond I, some people. Well, I, I, guess they're I asking pointed this people. out, so I'm in favor of make, it should definitely be less than a billion. <laughs> and, and it should be something in light of where we want Dream to maintain on. our, you know, our rating system, which we don't have. We're not even rated. Okay. Uh, and it also should be related to uh, debt burden, you know. So there are lots of things that you could look at, and I think that Anne Wright is probably a place you should start because they have all these benchmarks that people use in finance. Okay. Um, and, Thank you. And I personally don't care what that number is as long as it's somewhat reasonable. Right. Gotcha. Did we get a list of comparable municipalities? We have things. Mm -hmm. We did. Yeah, we looked at some. We they, were looked. All, they were all similar. Five, ten percent. Yeah. Now the other, the other part is a lot of them like similar communities like neighboring <coughs> Fort Myers Beach, a ton of water, but it's a much smaller community compared to how large Medina is. Mm -hmm. and that, you know. But we we will look at it. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. And then um, city name change <laughs> from City of Bonita Springs to Bonita Beach. I'll leave that to the committee. We have one person, two maybe. <laughs> And so that's why we could we did not agree on this. Okay. And uh, but we didn't no, vote. We we didn't vote because yeah. it was not. We didn't vote. Okay. Yeah. Um, but did you, did did anyone yeah. look into the expense of what that would be? Well, that's that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You have to look at it with the expenses, and, and there are places uh, that uh, we found, or someone found, maybe Yeah, I you. speak to it a bit. Just yeah. I, I brought it up, not in the, there was no one in the committee that basically said, hey, we, we're in favor of this. It was simply something to bring up to say, would council want us to even consider studying that concept? Some cities have done it, and their taxable revenue has gone up significantly. Mm -hmm. But is that taxable revenue increase greater than the cost of actually doing it, we don't have the slightest idea. And so if this were ever to go to a public, uh, uh, to have people actually vote on it, just wondering whether the council wanted us to do further research so that people could be provided with that type of information, because we don't have any idea about any of it at this point. But there has been a lot of people on the beach that if you go into most of the shops there, most of the t-shirts, everything says Bonita Beach. It doesn't mm -hmm. say City of Bonita I know, Springs. yeah. Which I couldn't uh, find one. Yeah, the, the entire city seems to be more focused on the beach than it is on the older spring. And uh, tourist dollar wise, um, it certainly seems to be beneficial to a lot of cities that have done it. But I've no, none of us know any idea about the expenses, what, what's involved. That's why we we're bringing it up, if it's even something that we should be uh, investigating. It seems to me that it's too late in this, in our workings. But it might be something that you all want to look at and have researched. I was going to say something similar, which is this is a big branding exercise. Mm -hmm. talking yeah, about. so uh, it's and not something that, that we could put on the ballot right. and give anybody right. any kind of feeling as to the cost yeah. or the or benefits. Benefit. Or the benefits. Would, would there well, that be something we would do through the charter anyway? Uh, ultimately, you would need to change it through a... You would have to change the charter. So, I've, like, if the city decided they want to do, we could do a little investigation, and then we could call a charter commission, even though it isn't. You, you could, like, you could, you, you could put special. forth a change. You, you could put charter. forth your own change. Right. Okay. Well, the issue with Benita Springs for me is I abbreviate <laughs> BS Council. <laughs> BS. You know, when I do my files, so you know. Also, BB. So, <laughs> so it's very. So it's BB. Very no, because I'd also label if I was coming down here a BS vacation. Yeah. See, and well, we got the no. BS Bullshark. Yeah, that's a BS BS high school. Well, I think it's a whole. Uh, I think it's a, a branding question. Yeah. yeah. In addition to the the cost yeah. Yeah. thing, and whether and and the direction in which the city is going, you know, we might have did a, a beach community 
maybe 10 years ago, but I, I'm not sure that we're totally identified in that way, we, and maybe we, we don't want to be either, because that's just one aspect of the attraction to tourism, is the beach. In springs in the same way. I mean, yeah. are, we, are we still as tied into spring? Fair point. You know, Benita is a, mm -hmm. means beautiful, and given that I think Lover's Key State Park is a part of Benita, um, if you had to choose at least one defining quality, are beautiful beaches. Right. So if you're sitting in the Midwest looking online at a place to go visit in Florida and you see Benita Springs, <laughs> that's no different than Ocala or any other place that's in the middle of Florida versus if you see Benita Beach, I think you'd be certainly more, or at least when you come home to tell your friends where you live, where you just bought your condo. Um, Let's say Naples, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the original thought was Naples Beach. So you know. Naples Beach. Most people haven't heard Naples of Benita North. Springs. But wait, <laughs> but we're not going yeah. to look right. into this right. any right. further. Yeah. We, but it, we are giving you the yeah. idea that It's an interesting job. concept that I think needs a lot right. of effort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is something. All right. All right, miscellaneous round. What? Um, <laughs> John, anything, want to kind of go around the horn? John, anything in particular you want to talk about or expound upon? Or? Well, I, I, you know, I feel obligated to talk about this one section, which is um, 56. 56. So that's on page 33 on the ethics issue. Uh, and the fact that I'm talking about it is in no way a reflection on the level of ethics within the committee here. So just... Uh, wanted to talk about this change. Uh, for the most part, the <clears throat> our work on the committee has resulted in these proposed changes. I mean, it's a legislative process. It may not have started that way where we all agreed, but in the end, we have pretty much all agreed to the changes that you see in front of you um, on a unanimous vote. A couple of these were not that way, so we thought we'd just kind of give you a quick pro and con and kind of <coughs> let you know what we're wrestling with here. Um, on 56, the, the standards of, of conduct um, the, um, and the disclosure of campaign contributions um, from any individual or organization uh, that might be affected by a land use decision could be the applicant, their consultants, adjacent property owners, or any individual who's communicated an interest. So that could include anybody who comes to the mic and speaks up. Um, I, you know, I, I understand there's a, a, a concern here that, uh, in regard to full disclosure. Um, I think it's not a particularly workable system. First of all, all of the campaign contributions are already disclosed and made available mm -hmm. um, to the public. Um, second, uh, there's probably hardly a, a meeting that goes by that you don't have something that could be construed as land use decision uh, in front of you. So I'm not sure how you can stay on top of this, especially if ahead of a vote, you don't know who might come up and talk about it or, I mean, of course, you know the developer, you know the applicant, whoever that might be, um, but um, it, it makes it sort of an after-the-fact disclosure with regard to campaign contributions. And I, I raise a concern, it, it, if it were me and it was a big issue like, I don't know, um, a boat access here that involves a, a big part of the community, um, you might just end up saying, okay, here's everybody who's contributed to my campaign. Um, you know, figure out, you know, I can't pick out the 100 people who have talked to me or have come up and, and spoken on this issue. Um, so you, you kind of, the default is, well, here's just everybody who's contributed to my campaign. So I think it's a, a difficult issue to manage, um, mm -hmm. even though it's a, a, a laudable effort to try and make sure that if anybody's got a financial interest in what's happening, they that that's been made known to the public. Mm -hmm. Can I just make an observation? I think you get a broad problem because you've got a broad umbrella. If you treat everything as a land use issue, I think you got a fair point. I'm just thinking back, Pete, uh, like two weeks ago, uh, Adam Boitana came up with a proposal, and um, I, both Peter and I disclosed uh, that he had contributed, or his family had contributed to us uh, in the context of or run for office. I also mentioned part of New Jersey that I'm supporting the guy. Uh, just as transparency. So, I mean, you might want to think about if you limit the ambit, it's not everything that could be a land use. It's basically, call it what you want, and let the lawyer tell you, zoning, an example like that. You just make a disclosure, that's all. But I didn't think that disclosure would be too much. You've already said that he's 
contributed. So why make another point of it? Are you having, you know, to me that's sort of like, oh, should I be concerned? And people, then, people know. but they do know. Right. It's well, public. Know. It's public information. Yeah. And well, people look at that. Um, but the other issue was, um, you know, that you're supporting him. Well, you don't have to add that. Right. I mean, it makes no difference really. Right. So. Just people. So you just get more. <coughs> Yeah, you could be in a position where somebody, oh, he's a friend, I gave him some money. I might be against whatever his position is mm -hmm. on this land use. Well, suggesting is, I've got to dis well, got suggesting to is there's a way to go back and think about it. Yes. No, yep. Not have it every land use remotely and, you know, maybe more limited. That's well, keep it simple. Right. Okay. It's already disclosed. Yeah, I'm using just. It's already disclosed, and then furthermore, if you're going to try to do it one way, the barn door has to swing both ways. So now, every little list that you send out an email, every person who sends that, forwards that, sends something to the city, they too are now invested in a project or a problem. So and now, that's now do you have to do the disclosure there too? And then what if somebody yeah. misses yeah. one? We have a disclosure. Right. Why are we trying to re exactly. add more bureaucracy to this process? I don't yeah. understand. No, I, I mean, to, just to I agree. finish this cut the point here, I guess, just so cold. You know. <laughs> well, the, then you got the second new section in 56 that talks about the council should not unintentionally engage in ex parte communications. I'm sorry, should not intentionally engage with any individuals regarding land use petition. Um, so this, this is in here, and there's some sentiment that this, again, would be an effort of good government at avoiding undue influence in these land use decisions. On the other hand, um, you know, in terms of open government, is it appropriate that the council is able to talk to the people in town and get exactly. their view, not only the developer, um, but also anybody who's got a position on the issue? And I think it sort of unduly ties the hand and mm -hmm. makes us sort of implies that the you know the council <coughs> can't be trusted to right. have these sort of uh, meetings and properly disclose them. And then I know you know there are others like Omer who you know have seen some of this firsthand in terms of you know. A, development projects and you know is has expressed concern about um, having to make decisions on the fly so there's a concern that the council would be less informed I mean we know the staff does a good job in informing you but if, if there's not some communication between the council and developers somebody might have a very good idea as to how to change this project in a way that's going to make it acceptable for everybody but you're kind of you're putting the developer or whoever the applicant is on the spot to try and react to something that comes down from the from the council. So, um, so those are I, I think I tried to express some of the back and forth on that. Go ahead, Chris. Chris, and then Jesse. Okay, uh, I'm just a little bit surprised that council wants to get involved with discussions with developers over land use. Uh, I look at the downtown Bonita Springs lot layouts. It certainly doesn't appear that there are uh, credible developers that are coming into Bonita Springs wanting to develop the bamboo parcel or the longitude part of the parcel. And you have to ask yourself the question, why? And I think it, it gets involved in the whole notion that somehow in order to gain access to that that ground and be able to buy it you first of all need to figure out who it is on council i've got to go to and talk to the city on the other hand has set up uh, the cda it set up its own zoning board uh, and it's coming up as i understand with a form use code for the development of downtown so my question would be is why in the world would the council get involved in something that has taken pains over the years to set up an administrative solution and let that administrative solution work? The way that it is now, I think there's a lot of frustration with respect to people that work for the city, where sometimes they're not even asked as to what their opinion is with respect to a piece of development. Popeye's chicken, for example where somebody asked a question, where does CDA, where does zoning come out on? What I've seen in cities around the country is what, you know, it is more of a trend to a separation that says, look, we're going to have a redevelopment body that will, that will utilize a form-based code and we'll have a land clearance authority that will make the parcels available. 
the council should restrict itself, I think, to those situations where it has to act as a quasi-judicial body to make sure everybody understands this was a fair process. Everybody got a same bite of the apple. Everybody got to have a fair hearing before the zoning board and the CDA for their building permits. And we as a council, much like it would be if somebody came to you and said, hey, I need, I need to help with the CDA for getting a, a building permit, as I understand it, you stay out of that process. Well, you know, if you, if you gave that as a hypothetical, I would say to you, I'm sorry, um, I would call someone. I always do direct them back to, count, to city um, staff. Yeah, staff. staff. And I think everyone on council is, relies a little too much on staff to do our research and to do, but we do turn, I at least, John Domer, it's like on speed dial, if someone calls about land development and that, I, one, I tell them I don't want to, I don't meet with land developers. I, you know, you have a, you make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's when you come in front of the zoning board, and then it comes in front of us. So get your act together and find out what the zoning board's requiring of you. And don't hurt our water, don't hurt our environment, and so I don't need to meet with you. So I never, well, I mean, but you see, th the way this is written, um, the city council shall not intentionally engage, therefore I can't go to any downtown meetings. Right, I mean, I, I, any, actually, I can't even go to a Republican meeting. I can't go to a Democrat meeting that is a group of people. Because eventually someone is gonna talk, uh, you know, just passing. And, and, you know, I think it's a little insulting if someone says that we can't be trusted. And I know you, nobody here is saying that. But it does sort of imply that we need to really watch you folks. And there's no amount of money I think you could give any one of the persons on council that would, you know, change well, their integrities. No, I'm not and, suggesting And their that vote is. on something. In fact, the, the whole purpose of this is to protect council is to protect somebody saying, well, you know, I didn't talk to... But then I can't find out what's going on in the community. What's the vibe? Right. What is the concern? But you've got your staff that is able to report to you as to what's going on. Oh, so now staff is going to go to all these extra meetings and, and come back? And also, though, <laughs> staff tells us about something, that would be ex parte, too. Well, you, could so exempt, that would be, you could exempt staff. Well, no. Then, then, no, yeah, then it's one-sided. So. That would be what? What? That would be wrong. Well, I've talked to three different attorneys. Everyone has said, if you're going to deny being able to talk or hear something from a developer, you got to talk to nobody. That's right. That's, That's right. Nobody. That's right. That's what, That's what it done. says. Can't be done. That's what it says. Yes. So the, the committee. It, the committee. it is. It's if you're looking at a major project, to have zero discussion with with any of our representatives is absolutely ridiculous because there's going to be give and take in any type of development. How are they going to do give and take on the dice? How are you going to make decisions if you have a bunch of money on the line and you're trying to figure out how you're going to best do it? How are you going to do that on the dice? Furthermore, we have zoning for a reason. Once again, we have zoning for a reason. So why are we putting zoning elements into a charter review? And you know what? If, if you get people who are up there on the dais, we'd, we'd sit here, we, you sit there and you say that there's no credible developers who want to develop down in Old 41. I know a ton, okay? So your assessment of whether they're good or not good, how could you know that when we haven't even had an RFP? How could you know that? How do you oh, know okay. That? So, well, because I actually have, I go to the downtown alliance meetings. I sit down with people who are consistently getting the runaround, the bureaucratic runaround from the city. I sent one to Mike Gibson earlier this week. So, the, and the problem is this. As everyone can see. The problem is this. If you get people who are going to get up there, finally get all their plans, and it's the first time it's been discussed, now we have an issue. So you're going to agree or you're not going to agree. And so if you don't agree, now you're back in the bureaucratic loop. Two, day, two weeks later or a month later, now everything's on hold because, you know, I want this parking lot to be two. You want it to be one. But we have to do it on the day of. And if we don't do it the day of, we can't talk between now and then. That's nonsensical. Well, can I just make a suggestion that you guys... That's why you have to have yeah. it go back to us. Yeah, go back. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think it would be fair if, if there's a financial gain or some other type of gain, then that should be disclosed. But... Well, if, that, if that's the case, you should exclude, exclude yourself. Yeah. Exclude yourself. 
if you got if you're going to get financial gain or something, you oh, should exactly. Get, you know, that's what I said. That 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 should be like that's what we need. If there's a financial gain or a financial the, the, or even a but that's part of one one two already. I don't know how you yeah. could do this, but the problem I have with ex parte, be that with the staff or or with developers, is that I don't feel comfortable having individual council people negotiate right. anything. I, I, I right. think that should, if there's going to be any negotiations, then everybody in the council should be part of that. And there's a way of, um, what's the word, of accommodating the sensitivities of particular council, which in the long run allow, uh, um, increases the chances that they would be a positive vote. I think that's the way I see it. So I personally, I did do it initially, I just felt so uncomfortable when I first got on the council because of just that reason. It wasn't just an informational thing. It, and I disagree that even with ex parte that you cannot go to like the um, neighborhood meetings that we do it. Anybody that, it's a one way street. You can listen to anything you want as long as you don't ask any questions and you don't engage that person. And the same thing with like, I can, with well, the way this is written because I engage individuals just by every day when I take a walk. And when something came up, Everybody in my neighborhood would stop me and say, I want to talk about and have a comment about something. And I would say, well, I'll listen, but I can't comment. Or I, if, I, if you comment, i got to write you down on my report. And, I, and that was my normal thing. And it wasn't, you know, they didn't even understand what was happening there. Um, and I didn't mind doing that. Or, they know they, they saw their councilwoman and they had questions or yeah, wanted to and, talk. And, right. and then when I reported it, I half the time I didn't even know their names. So I would say met yeah. a resident and they generally were in favor or they're generally or they made this point as much as I could remember. But it puts an onus on the council if you have a lot of these to even report it properly, you know. So, um, but I think the reason that I don't do it is because I don't think it's good for individuals to negotiate with the with the developer. The staff has a, uh, has a format that they use in order to try to get concessions or improvements to the plan. That's part of their job as part of planning, so I can understand that. But even that, sometimes I think they go a little bit too much. But then the council could come back and say, I don't like that little negotiation or that little improvement that came out of, this, out of the staff or out of the zoning. We still have the point to review it. So I don't know how you could write it so that we could still listen to everybody, because I think we should. But I think the interchange is what bothers me. Well, I think that's up to each individual. I mean, who, you shouldn't be negotiating with them anyway, because that's not yeah. what your job is, is to do. Is, exactly. Your job as ex parte is to go there and listen and get their, get what they're trying to say. Hey, here's, what, here's my structure. Here's my, my zoning change. This is why it would be beneficial to me. Right. Now, and to the community. And to the community. Well, right. and to my, to my development right. and so on. There shouldn't be a back and forth or a give and take. Yeah. Hey, well, we'll give you a 75 if you put three couplas on there and put whatever on there. The that, but but, but again, that comes back to us, though, of doing what's right as, a, as, a, as an individual. We're human. Remember that. Well, I remember that. But you know, let, let's use you versus me or whatever. If you just go in there and listen, you don't have to say a word. All right, thanks. Bye. Yeah. But it was interesting. That you know, we're talking about this issue, and Jesse just said a moment ago, there was a, a, a guy that had a problem about a development, something it's in the bureaucracy, whatever. But, okay, correct me if when I say something wrong. Okay. You referred him to Mike to get his problem resolved. Okay, so I was at the Downtown Alliance. I met somebody who was having continual issues with the city. I directed him to the councilman of which he resides, which is Mike Gibson in District 5. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with okay, that. Okay, then. Can I make two observations to think about? And uh, then, yeah, Pete and then Mike. Yeah, one is uh, if you look at cities that do have ex parte limitations, there is flexibility, uh, including some major cities in Florida. Um, second is just an observation, which is um, we've got a system set up where someone comes in, he wants a change in the zoning law, something special for him or her, all right? He's not going through a standard procedure. We have a system set up, which includes public meetings, disclosure meetings to the public. Then we have uh, work at, besides the staff work, we have work at the advisory board, which is the zoning board, all right? So 
if you have a situation where it goes beyond information at the city council meeting, people will quickly figure out, well, the shortest distance between two points is to just <coughs> counsel people and cut through all this red tape. Well, the red tape is our entire process. So if you're opening a door to ex parte where people can give feedback and talk, you might as well get rid of the advisory board. And you might want to get rid of the public information meeting. There's a, there's a reason why when you have a zoning board meeting and you have a city council meeting, there's a stenographer there taking notes of everything that's being said. That's the record in this ex parte proceeding. If you have the opportunity through an open door over here to have people give signals and figure out what's good or bad, you might as well get rid of the stenographer, you might as well get rid of the ex parte meeting, you might as well get rid of the advisory board and just say, figure out a way to talk to four out of seven city council people. So I actually do think, in my mind, for this council, this is too strict, not too strict for me, but not it's too strict. And there are ways where you could have an informational meeting with a developer, I believe, with staff present, because part of it is staff can get undercut too, listen to what the developer has to say, so at least you can begin to understand there can be a lot of complexity in a process. But the, the silent nod, the I think you should put this on the third floor and this on the second floor, you, you're walking into a situation where you might as well get rid of your whole zoning process. So I would just suggest you think about that. There can be, I think there can be flexibility in this. Thanks. Mike and then Jesse. Um, well, the two, two things. The, the example you gave, you know, you said that we have staff and community development and there's a process for them to go through. But if they're building something that they're entitled to, it never comes to council anyway. Right. So the whole reason why they want to talk to council ahead of time is to know if they're wasting their time or not. For example, a previous council uh, that I was on, Wawa came to us and wanted ex parte meetings. And to judge, you know, they wanted to put a Wawa in on Old 41 and Benita Beach Road. And they never came to council. So I assume that the majority of council that they talked to was not happy with that. So, I mean, that just saved our time from having to have a meeting that we deny it on. It saved the developer time and money from having to, to go through the whole meeting process. So that's why I'm for ex parte. So okay. you're, you're fairly sure then that the residents didn't want Wawa either? Right. No, I oh, I, I got a lot of residents that, you know, keep asking me, when are we getting a Wawa? <laughs> it seems like everybody wants a Wawa except the last council, so. Is that like a Publix? No, it's a gas station sandwich oh, type what store. Je Jesse and then Omer. If that were the case, shouldn't we know, shouldn't the public know why that decision was made rather than do it, you know, one-on-one -on -one or four of them or whatever it is? I don't think that's a good process. Well, it's, it yeah, saves the person the a lot of money because if, if the council was going to yeah. vote that way anyway, Look how much time and money is but wasted by having to put Yeah, see, without, I wouldn't be able to answer that without, person. Without the whole thing, and <coughs> the whole thing laid out on you and a, a, a discussion with people. I, that doesn't, that bothers me, but you know, that you're entitled to your opinion. Jesse. I agree with Councilman Gibson, but I, I just want to say that if you think red tape is the process, then we might as well get rid of elected officials and turn the keys over to the staff. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. We might as well turn the keys over to the staff. Because that's the reason that you all are elected, is to make the decisions. So to sit here and say that red tape is the process, I can't believe we have an elected official who would say red tape is the process. Red we tape is the I problem. Don't think, I don't think Councilman O'Flynn was basically saying it's a, it's a mess and you just have to dive in and deal with it. I think what he was saying is that you have to go through the zoning board and you have to, you know. Right. And my point is we have a zoning board. And what we're trying to do here, what he was trying to do, is bring zoning things out of the charter review. What I'm saying is they're separate and no, no, I'm sorry. They are separate. What do you mean you're sorry? Yes, they are I'm separate. I'm sorry, you're not saying what he said. He did not say that. He did not say what? It's all good. It's okay. all good. Please go think about it. Whatever yeah. he said. Yeah. <laughs> do you have another point on this, or no? I think that's no. Okay, Omer, and then Greg. So just. I, I, speaking to try, ultimately, I think we're all trying to get the highest quality development everyone can get into Benita Springs and not have any kind of financial undue influence or some type of backroom deal. So what we're ultimately trying to do is bring everything to the light. 
So I don't think not having ex parte brings everything to the light. It just shuts it all out and actually forces it more into the dark. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want high quality development, I know a lot of very good high quality developers. And the larger national developers, the, the better quality developers, their number one resistance to actually doing a project is risk. So they, they can absolutely underwrite their finances very, very well. What they have a very difficult time with is risk. If you don't have any communication, you're going to ask a firm to come in and do a large scale project. They're going to spend, you're asking them to forward millions of dollars into enormous amounts of analysis that city staff requests. There's a lot of requests. The amount of specialists just on my project alone, every meeting was you know, tens of thousands of dollars. You have so many specialists involved. And to go through that entire process with no idea whatsoever what actually the city wants. And when you are asking for a zoning change, as you mentioned, right. that's the one unique situation where there really isn't something in the code that says, hey, to get greater density, you have to do X, Y, Z. That's the situation in which a large scale developer is going to want to have some understanding of what they can and can't do. That shouldn't be in a back room and it shouldn't be an individual council member giving a nod or a wink. Right. But if we had it more transparent where there is ex parte, maybe the ex parte is the entire staff together sitting down listening to it and just expressing their concerns. You know, right. hey, here are the issues that we see potential concerns coming up that are emotionally connected to us, which often is, very, at least in my process, was very different than staff. So the thing that staff may have been very concerned with were issues that council members were not concerned with, and there were things that council members were concerned with that simply never even came up through a year and a half long process of working with staff. So th I just think that you'll get better quality development by having more open communication. I think you're making very fair points, and um, I think there's a way to massage that language uh, in consistent with that. And we'll look at other places yeah. that Well, I was uh, just going to say, allow as high quality development doesn't have these issues. And the whole other thing going on here, which is our code has so many ambiguities, and I'm sure you know this, so many confusing things that staff gets put adrift of like, what the heck did that person mean? So part of the hard work that the zoning board is doing is actually bringing more certainty to that. And that's what the form, you know, and I've been pushing, let's get it done, but that's what the form based code is all about, which is let's lay that out and then that's administrative, get out of the way. And it gives developers a much, quality developers, a much more clear view of what the heck do these people want mm -hmm. as opposed to try to be yes. figuring it out. Numbers together, that's what I'm doing. We'll oh, take care of that. You're, you're good? Okay. Well, Jackie, I'm, it's, I'm just kind of moving around the table here. Do you, something you want to dive in, in for at the moment, or yeah. you're good? Okay, we'll thank do, you for all your... We'll do everything that yes. we do. Yeah. Yes, Chris? And as you say, I, I was just kind of going around, but no? No. Jesse? Nope. Amy? I have a question on page 26 of section 47, uh, where we cross out the things about um, every appropriation shall lapse at the close of the fiscal year. Does that mean that our appropriations don't lapse? Converse true? Because I know that with, I'm going to ask this a specific question, with art and public places we've right. kind of discussed because there's a budget that's in there and there seems to be this great impetus to spend every dollar at the end of the year because it goes. So, so oh. is that what we're doing here? I, I don't believe that addresses that issue. I think what we've talked <laughs> about is what we probably need to do is get a, a CIP project oh, for art and public <laughs> and then move that into the different category where it Rolls over, but, but this, <coughs> this is that. Why doesn't that happen? I mean, does this apply to everything? This, this is my question. In, in in theory, this would apply to everything, but in practice, we haven't really been following it. But should we make that? Should we improve that so it doesn't apply to everything? Maybe already? they should look at it. Yeah. Well, the the issue the issue is, and, and so if if there's let's say there's a unexpended allocation. Mm -hmm. Hundred thousand dollars for some tree fund or something like that. And it goes for three years. Right. This language is saying in year four, it comes out. But the city passes a new budget every year, basically sets up new things. So in year four, if the city just puts it back on there again, that would be the process to reallocating it. So it's sort of a, a circular 
provision in, in the fact that it doesn't really change anything in the Does that restart the clock? But, but there, are two, well, there are two sentences here. Like the, clock the first right. one does not have anything to do about three years. That's mm -hmm. my question. It's in the first sentence that I would like clarification. Every appropriation except an appropriation for capital expenditure shall lapse at the end. We're capital. taking yeah. that out. She's discussing what is a general fund yeah. appropriation for, mm -hmm. but that's not specific to a capital Correct. And then you start capital talking project. about capital. So it's a, it's a funding item of the Art of Public Places Board. It's not for a particular capital improvement. It's right. for the overall actions of the board. And typically, that's zeroed out at the end of the yeah. fiscal year. Yeah. It doesn't roll over. Should. Yeah, it should. Yeah. Well, and then next year, if they put should, that same amount in. It doesn't in. look like it is here. Oh, I got to bet my. That's my question. I agree. What I do you don't, think? Why are we taking that first sentence out, is my question. Because I think, as rule, as a budget, it's always zeroed out at the end of the year. They're saying they policy. do it anyhow, whether it's in the charter. Yeah, whether okay. we, yeah, that's the way I took it. So, yeah. but we're relying on policy to do policy. that rather than the charter. Well, I think we're. I mean, the reason we're, we're, we're relying on good budgeting process. Charter, we're relying on FGFOA to Florida government and yeah, county and standards county, to yeah. Yeah. the proper GAT, the proper uh, government standards, like <laughs> either through Gadsby. But what we were trying to figure out is, did this provision provide anything that additional, any additional benefit or policy direction that we weren't otherwise following? And okay. speaking with Ann, we check it out. That. If this is, you know, if, if we have these uh, county sta standards for fund accounting, but when I, I have concern about this. I don't know what the answer is, but I don't want all those appropriations to roll over. All right, and we'll fix it. Very <laughs> okay, thanks. Greg, I'm good. Laura, I'm good. Peter, good. Mike, yeah. Fred, you're all set. I've got I've got seven yeah. item notes that I'll bring back to the. Uh, <laughs> seven. seven. He only started with four. Thanks, guys. Yeah, really thank great you work. Guys. Thank you. You just added one. Job. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think we're good, and we'll see everybody for five thirty city council meeting. Not everybody, but six. Uh, six, six I'm sorry, six o'clock. Excuse me, six o'clock. Great. Thanks. Everybody.